Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Today is Budget Day in Alberta. The UCP says due to the pandemic, the books won't be balanced anytime soon. The group representing arrested Pastor James Coates has filed a request with the courts to have him released from custody. And the topic of bullying is addressed in a powerful new Christian film called Switched. We speak with the producer of the Hollywood movie. Your nation. Your province. Your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Robbins. Thanks so much for joining us. It was Budget Day in Alberta. Premier Jason Kenney's UCP government was promising more help in the fight against COVID-19 along with no new taxes. Kenney says the budget's focus was getting Alberta past the pandemic and rebuilding the economy. Last year, after COVID-19 took hold, the government abandoned its plan to balance the books within the first term. The 2021 budget will set aside $1.25 billion to continue to fight COVID-19 and increase the Department of Health's budget by another $900 million. Also discussed at the legislature was a politician recall bill. It will outline how disgruntled Albertans would be able to recall elected officials between elections. The Justice Center for Constitutional Freedom says it will file a request with an Alberta court to release a pastor from jail who is accused of holding full church services violating public health restrictions. The group representing Pastor James Coates of Grace Life Church in Spruce Grove says he should be freed from custody until the case is heard. He has not committed any crime and it's uh, par for the course in a free society in a free country like Canada that when people are accused of a crime they are presumed innocent until proven guilty and unless you've been accused of you know murder or rape or assault or something pretty serious the normal thing is that you are released on bail uh, pending trial and we're in a situation right now where pastor Coates runs the risk of staying in prison for more than two months uh, having been put into prison on february 21st and no trial date until may 3rd so we're looking at, at almost two and a half months of jail. So we are um, filing an, an appeal with the Alberta Court of Queen's bench, and we hope to get him out of jail as soon as possible, and that is our goal. Pastor Coates was arrested last week and remanded in custody on a charge of breaking bail conditions after being charged earlier this month with violating Alberta's Public Health Act. There are reports from the Canadian press that Canadians who have been taken to various quarantine hotels have been allegedly sexually assaulted. Calgary Conservative MP Michelle Rempel Garner says she was quite shaken by one of the stories involving a young woman from Southern Ontario. It's pretty bad. Um, so without reading the details, she said that she tried to contact hotel security. It, they took over 15 minutes to arrive. Uh, they were knocking on my door and you know what they're doing? They gave me a bottle of water. After the event, which of course was the alleged sexual assault, the uh, victim was offered by security guards to go to the hospital on the condition that she returned back to the hotel. And this article also states that no photos or videos can be shared while in these quarantine facilities, that residents are not allowed to use the security locks inside their rooms. And in this victim's room, it had been removed altogether stating that this will allow access to your room in an emergency. It makes me feel very uncomfortable um, and also just uh, tremendously, tremendously angry because the federal government has a duty of care and they failed it. Lethbridge MP Rachel Harder echoed the comments of MP Michelle Rempel Garner, except what really upset MP Harder were comments made by Federal Health Minister Patty Hydew following the concerns raised by Rempel Garner in the House of Commons. The Health Minister responded by saying this. She said, and I quote, every woman deserves to live a life free of violence and a life of dignity. Great statement. She went on to say, but, but these border measures are in place to protect Canadians. They're in place to protect Canadians? Was the minister listening to the question? Because there was an individual who was kept in one of these facilities who was sexually violated. What happened to her safety? 
It appears as though new COVID-19 case counts continue to come down in Alberta. Late yesterday, the Alberta government reported just 267 new cases of the virus. Health officials say there are still 326 people in hospital, along with 51 in intensive care. There are currently 4,516 active cases in the province, and sadly, there were also 11 new deaths reported related to the virus. Now looking at the zones across the province, the Calgary zone currently has 1,612 active cases of COVID-19. The Edmonton zone is next with 930. The north zone has 875 active cases. The central zone, including Red Deer, has 745. And here in the south zone, there are 350 active cases of the novel coronavirus. That includes 208 in Lethbridge and 21 in Medicine Hat. Fortunately, more than 125,000 Albertans have also recovered from COVID-19. As for inoculations, close to 181,000 doses have been administered in our province. There are now close to 74,000 Albertans who have been fully vaccinated with two doses. Alberta's phased approach to vaccination continues to focus on priority health care workers and our seniors. The province announced today that as of February 25th, 100,000 Alberta seniors over the age of 75 are now booked to receive their COVID-19 vaccination. An additional 22,000 who reside in congregate care are also booked. Not only have many provinces been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, but also a drug crisis. Here in Lethbridge, we've had similar issues of addictions and overdose deaths. Julie Kissick with the Streets Alive mission works with the homeless and many who are addicted to meth and fentanyl on a daily basis. She says when the people from Lethbridge Overdose Prevention Society set up an unsanctioned tent in our city last year, they actually created more harm than good. I think that he should encourage the people to go to the proper OPS site because they've got medical staff there, they've got social workers, they've got addiction workers, they've got everything set up there to help the person from point A to point B instead of just getting stuck at point A. So I think they're actually doing a disservice to the addicted population. Catch the full interview with Julie Kissick and myself as we discuss how Streets Alive helps the most vulnerable in our city. That's coming up in the second half of our program. Students enrolled in the Integrated Management Experience Program at the University of Lethbridge's Dillon School of Business have taken charge of the Streets Alive Mosaic Fundraiser. The students say that this beautiful piece of artwork will go towards fundraising efforts at the Streets Alive mission in our city. Micah Quinn has the story. Mural Mosaic has done work in the past for the 2010 Vancouver Olympics, and now they'll be designing this new mural for the Streets Alive Mosaic fundraiser. So what the Mosaic fundraiser really is, is it is a, a collaborative community art piece. That's what it is, right? So what that means, if you're not familiar with what the term mural is, it's a bigger picture uh, with smaller pictures inside of it. You can actually buy different um, tiers. We have a tier. We have... Um, a few tiers that you can buy of different sizes and different packages that you can get along with it, right? We have four by four tile and an eight by eight tile. And there is uh, two different four by four and two different eight by eights. And, and there's actually a package that also comes with, you know, the tiers you can get shipped um, all the way from the top end. You can get uh, this, we, we, we ship this really cool document, this really cool thing straight from Mural Mosaic. They're the artists, they're based in uh, Sturgeon County, Alberta. I think that's just north of Edmonton. They, uh, they put great work together and, and some of the, Besides just the tile on the wall, which is already awesome, you also will get a thing you can put in your home, a canvas of the mural, an actual picture of the mural, along with a picture of the tile that you actually put in. The fundraiser is emphasizing the theme of human connection and hope. And when the public choose their tiles, they can include a picture that is meaningful to them. So a picture of your grandmother, a loved one, somebody um, who you haven't seen in a, big, a long time, maybe a, a, a role model or a hero. Um, and that's what we mean by human connection. One of the driving forces for the students in making this fundraiser was to bring a connection during a time when so many of us are feeling disconnected. So we felt like this would be a good way of having all these pictures of all these people showing their support for people that are in need and saying, we are still here and we still support you. Donations will be accepted until the end of March and the start of May is when the mural should be up on the side of the Streets Alive Mission building. To purchase a tile and make a donation to this fundraiser, you can visit streetsalivemosaic.ca. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Around this time last year, professional bull riders from all over the world would be preparing themselves for the annual PBR event in Lethbridge at the NMAC Centre. Now this year's event unfortunately has been cancelled because of the pandemic. BCN's Ainsley O'Reilly spoke with some bull riders who shared how much they miss their sport and what their plans are for the remainder of the year. The PBR Canada Cup at the NMAC Centre is an event that bull riders look forward to each year. 
That was one of my favorite events, you know. Uh, I have been to it every year. I think I, I've won it three times. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just been really good. And it was uh, one of the first big ones of the year where everybody kind of got together and we're rolling out the new year. Between the Canadian Professional Rodeo Association and Professional Bull Riders Association, in a normal year, these athletes keep busy. If you went to everything, you could go to 80 a year. As, uh, we're always traveling around a lot. Like our main, it's our main source of income is to be able to go to these events and win the money. Each bull rider trains differently but stresses the importance of staying in shape. Time off really did help my body um, uh, heal up and gave me a lot of time to recuperate and feel good again. They compete with injuries all the time. And, you know, for especially some of the guys that are kind of getting up there in years to actually have some time to, to some long-term time to heal up, I actually think there's potential to extend some of their careers. Many in the sport have traveled to the United States to compete but remain optimistic that 2021 will see them back at it in Western Canada. Definitely looking forward to it. I've uh, nearly been going stir crazy with no events to go to or anything like that. So it's uh, what we live for. And yeah, with nothing going on, it's sort of a lull in the year and really hard to sort of keep motivated. We got goals that we want to achieve and as the year gets on without any events, those goals are limited. For Bridge City News, I'm Ainsley O'Reilly. The Saskatchewan government is trying to clear up some confusion about how and when people over the age of 70 can receive their COVID-19 vaccine. More than 80% of long-term care residents and 75% of personal care residents in the province receive their first doses. Anyone, however, over the age of 70 who lives independently has mostly been left in the dark. The health authority says it is using contact lists generated by eHealth to identify people by location and age who are then contacted by phone. Dr. Hassan Masri was the first doctor in Saskatoon to get the COVID-19 vaccine. He says that it took a few days for his body to adjust, but he's feeling healthy and much more confident when working with COVID-19 patients in the ICU. So to know that I am protected from that adds a lot of um, comfort, not just physical comfort, you know, but also mentally you feel that work is a lot less stressful. Uh, my interactions with every patient doesn't seem like a ticking bomb, uh, right? You know, because masks and PPE are extremely helpful in protecting us from getting COVID-19, but they're not 100%. Nothing is really 100%, but having an extra layer of protection in the, in the shape of a vaccine is uh, I, I have to say that I mentally and emotionally and physically feel a lot safer and a lot more at peace going to work and, and dealing with patients who have COVID-19. I think people who work in the ICU have a, a different uh, a dimension of understanding of what having COVID-19 feels like. So it has added a lot of safety uh, to my mental and emotional health. Health officials in Manitoba are reporting 45 new cases of COVID-19, which is the lowest daily total since last October. There was also one additional death linked to a virus at a nursing home in Winnipeg. The drop in infections is being reported as the province opened vaccination appointments for seniors and for First Nations people over the age of 75. Vaccinations are also opening up to the general public, including high-risk groups such as personal care residents. The military is investigating Defense Chief Admiral Art McDonald for alleged misconduct. This is just weeks after military police launched an investigation into allegations against his predecessor, General Jonathan Vance. Defense Minister Harjit Sejan says McDonald has stepped aside but did not detail the allegations. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-Francois Blanchet says the reputation of Canada's military is at stake. There is a problem of leadership which is being shown by this situation and you know, it's not from yesterday that we hear of such terrible events happening in the forces. I think that the message from the minister and the government must be that the army can be no less than exemplary and that they will not look elsewhere, but get into this to make sure that everything is done in order to restore confidence in the leadership of the army. Blanchett says the Trudeau Liberals must allow for a thorough investigation. 
The switch to have some MPs and senators log into Parliament remotely could save taxpayers as much as $6.2 million annually. The Parliamentary Budget Officer's report suggests that reduced travel during the pandemic has been a key part of the savings. It also notes that the reduced travel also meant reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Zhang En was a member of a large house church in China that was raided and shut down by the government. But the persecution the church experienced served to fuel the faith of its members. Here's a personal story now and an account of a Chinese Christian and the persecution he had to endure. It's hard for myself to imagine my past life. I called myself a red kid. I used to be a communist, an atheist, Marxist. My conversion story can properly sum up in one verse. I say a chapter one, verse 18. Even though your sin is as red as scarlet, I will make it as white as snow. That color red has a double meaning for me personally. My life used to be dominated by that red authority, communist regime. The climate for Christians in China is uh, like going through a bitter winter. The government won't install facial recognition cameras in our sanctuary. Of course, we refuse that unreasonable demand. Then they installed cameras at the lobby of our church building. That camera can gather the private data of our church members, and then they can target our church members to intimidate them. They will intimidate them with their jobs, their housings, and their children's education to prevent them from going to church. In 2018, this new regulation on religious affairs took effect. Several prominent house churches in China were shut down. Hundreds of policemen raided our church, smashed our building, put the pastors on the civilians, and shut down the church. The level of persecution in China is at its worst level since the Cultural Revolution in 1960s and 70s. We are so united together like never before. We have a revival in our church. A lot of our brothers and sisters, they were so encouraged by this experience, even in the severe persecution. After my church was shut down by the government, the first sermon I preached is from uh, Revelation, chapter three, um, verses seven and eight. I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Even though the persecution is intensifying, there are a lot of brothers and sisters still be very faithful, very brave to testify the glory of Jesus Christ. Powerful story. There's a new Christian film airing on Pure Flix called Switched. It stars John Schneider and Denise Richards. Now, the premise of the film is addressing bullying and what our teenagers face today. Alexandra Boylan is the producer of the movie Switched. She says when it comes to bullying, there are underlying issues which really need to be addressed. Actually, that was a big part of the movie was showing why is a bully a bully? And usually it's because something in their life is broken, their heart is broken, their family life is broken, and maybe they need love and they need to be seen. And if we could heal the heart of a bully, we could stop a chain reaction of that person bullying people because they have their needs met. Alexandra will also share her journey of being bullied as a teenager and how she overcame it. That Q&A is coming up in the second half of our program. Well, we had another wind warning in our region today. Fortunately, the Chinook winds brought us warmer temperatures, but that's all about to change. Well, weather details are on deck. Environment Canada issued another wind warning for southwestern Alberta today. We had wind gusts up to 90 kilometers an hour. Now the Chinook winds should be leaving us, making way for old man winter to pay us a visit once again. Jeanette Rocher is here now with a complete look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, 
we could see flurries develop Friday and into the weekend. Yeah, that's right. There's actually a 60% chance of flurries developing Friday and into Saturday. We should see those wind gusts die down a bit to, to about 50 kilometers per hour tomorrow compared to the 90 kilometers that they were earlier today with that wind warning in effect, of course. So that, of course, dying down. And then we're going to see snow develop over Friday to Saturday. Two degrees is our high for Friday, minus two the expected high for Saturday. Into Sunday and Monday, lots of sunshine and beautiful temperatures up to nine and 10 degrees for those days. Five is the expected high for Tuesday with a mix of sun and cloud and nine degrees for next Wednesday. So we're definitely seeing into the double digits there or close to for next week, putting us well above this average high for this time of year, which is three minus low the or minus nine, rather the expected low, the average low for this time of year. 19 degrees was our high temperature back in 1992. And it was a chilly minus 33 back in 1994. 722 is when the sun rose this morning and our sun set at six. 07 p.m. So looking to the west coast, actually Victoria under a wind warning today, they could expect some gusts up to 80 kilometers per hour overnight and into tomorrow as well, high of 10 degrees sunshine. Vancouver also very windy, 80 kilometer per hour winds. Uh, very comparable to last bridge today. Sunshine and eight degrees there. Minus five, the expected high tomorrow in Edmonton and minus one in Calgary. 60% chance of flurries in both Edmonton and Calgary for tomorrow. Chance of flurries also expected tomorrow in Saskatoon. Minus six, the high there. Zero, the expected high for Regina. Chance of flurries. Uh, light rain and mixed with snow tomorrow for Winnipeg. As we look further east into central Canada, we get into Toronto area. Sunshine for all our friends in Toronto, three degrees the high, zero expected to be the high in Ottawa. Chance of flurries there. Sunshine in Montreal tomorrow with a high of minus four. As we look further east into Atlantic Canada, sunshine in Fredericton, minus six the high. Chance of flurries in Halifax, minus three the high there, minus eight in Charlottetown. A snow squall watch in effect for St. John's, Newfoundland. Those snow squalls could bring up to 10 centimeters of snow and blowing snow, especially in, in open areas there, minus one, the expected high. There you go, that is your forecast. Today's weather is brought to you by ColumbianDirect.com. Cafe Coffee, specialty coffee from our family to yours. Loblaw Companies is reporting a higher fourth quarter profit and revenue as e-commerce sales spiked 160% amid the pandemic. The grocery retailer and drugstore chain says food sales were up. Those costs associated with the safety of customers and workers remained elevated. Loblaw says its net earnings were up 26% from a year ago to $345 million, boosted in part by an extra week in the quarter. Revenue totaled $13.29 billion. That's up from $11.59 billion. Maple Leaf Foods also had a profitable fourth quarter. It was up 45% from a year ago to $25.4 million. The food processing company says sales rose more than 10% to $1.13 billion due to gains in both its meat protein and plant protein groups. Meat protein group sales were up 11.3%, while plant-based protein sales rose 5.5%. The company says on an adjusted basis, it earned $0.30 cents per share, beating analyst expectations of $0.21. Cents. Trans Mountain, which is owned by the federal government, is asking the Canada Energy Regulator to keep secret the identities of the companies that provide insurance coverage for its pipeline system. Trans Mountain has fears environmental activists could target those firms. The company that operates the pipeline says there's evidence certain parties are using filings in the regulator's database to identify insurers and pressure them to drop their policies for the pipeline. Suncor Energy says former TC Energy CEO Russ Gerling is returning to the energy producer. He will stand for election to its board of directors in May. The Calgary-based energy giant says Gerling is well known in the North American energy industry following a long 35-year career. Gerling recently retired after 26 years at TC Energy. That included 10 years as both president and chief executive officer. He previously worked at Suncor, Dome Petroleum and Northbridge Energy Marketing. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 260 points on the day to finish at 18,224. The Dow was down 559 points to 31,402. The S&P 500 was down 96 points to 3829. And the NASDAQ was down 478 points on the day to 13,119. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 29 cents to 63.51 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 3 cents to 276 US. 
Gold was up 20 cents to 1770.76 an ounce, and silver was up 2 cents to 27.45 US an ounce. Wheat is at $308 per metric ton, barley is at $310, canola is at 773, and corn is at $345 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 43 cents to 117, feeder cattle were up 5 cents to 140.43, and lean hogs were up 33 cents to 89.75. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 79.35 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedom says it will file a request with the Alberta court to release a pastor accused of holding full church services violating public health restrictions. The group representing Pastor James Coates of Grace Life Church in Spruce Grove says he should be freed from custody until the case is heard. Coates was arrested last week and remanded in custody on a charge of breaking bail conditions after being charged earlier this month with violating Alberta's Public Health Act. The start of a three-day trial for Coates has been set for May the 3rd. There's a powerful new Christian film out which addresses the issue of bullying. It is called Switched. The film stars John Schneider and Denise Richards. Coming up, an interview with the show's producer, Alexandra Boylan. A sneak peek of the film, along with a 15-minute Q&A, is coming up shortly. Today on Bridge City News, we're going to talk about filmmaking with a message, filmmaking with a difference. Our guest today is Alexandra Boylan. She and her sister Andrea are co-founders of Mustard Seed Entertainment. Alexandra is the producer of the movie called Switched, starring John Schneider and Denise Richards, which is now streaming on pureflix.com. She's also author of Create Your Own Career in Hollywood, Advice from a Struggling Actress Who Became a Successful Producer. Now, before we start talking about this amazing movie with Alexandra, let's take a sneak peek of the film. Are you ready to practice? Mom, I can't do it. Juliara would be crazy not to enroll you. It's just stage fright. I want to be someone else who is popular that everyone likes. I want to be Katie Sharp. Isn't she one of the mean girls? She's popular, she's beautiful and confident. Oh, her life is perfect. Poor girl, she looks like she got her clothes from the dump. Hi, Katie. I just wanted to wish you luck on your glam slam job because <laughs> I'm sorry. Here, you can wear my shoes. I wouldn't be caught dead in your shoes. She's coming. Sis, I'm so sorry. I don't want to talk about it. Dear God, please show Katie Sharp what it's like to walk a day in my shoes. 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 Wow! <laughs> that looks like an amazing movie. Lots of energy here. Alexandra, the producer of Switch, joins me now from Los Angeles, California. It's good to have you on Bridge City News. Thank you for having me, Hal. So how would you summarize that film, Switched? Switched is about two girls in high school. One is the bully and one is the girl that she bullies. And the girl that she bullies prays that the other girl would know what it's like to walk a day in her shoes. And they wake up switched and they find empathy and love and compassion for each other. Now, I understand that the premise for this movie actually comes from your own personal experience. You grew up as a PK, as a pastor's kid, and went through some teasing and bullying yourself. Oh, yeah, big time. I, uh, I actually grew up in a very affluent town, but I was the PK, so I used to have to go down to the basement of the church and pick clothes out from, you know, hand-me-downs from people in the church, and then I would go to school, and the kids would torment me and bully me, and I used to always think, I mean, if they could imagine what it was like to walk a day in my shoes, to have to go down and pick from other people's clothes, would they have love and empathy for me, and that was some, such an inspiration for Switched. Now, schools have been working very hard for decades to try and eliminate bullying altogether, but the issue is still with us. Do you think things are improving slowly with schools, or do we have a long way to go? I think with social media, it's escalated tenfold. You know, when we were kids, you know, you get they bully you, you go home, you cry in the backyard, it blows over in a few days. We really incorporated social media into this movie because we wanted to show kids that when you put something out there, even if you delete it, somebody could have screenshot it and shared it. And so be very careful with what you put out there because you can't take it back. You know, you're right. Absolutely. It's very, very scary when it comes to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. There's so much online bullying going on. And then the suicide rates with preteens and teens is going through the roof. 
specifically because of the online bullying. I know, I know. That's why we felt this movie was so important to address those issues and to do it in a fun way where kids will want to watch it and then walk away and go, oh, wow, I don't want to treat somebody like that. Or, oh, what would that feel like if I did that? And hopefully that would change their perspective. Wasn't that in the Bible as well? Treat others the way you want to be treated? You know, it's so does the film really address why people become bullies? Uh, we do talk about it in the film. Uh, the girl who is the bully has a lot of pressure at home from her parents to be a certain way. And that pressure has led her to go to school and act a certain way. And actually, that was a big part of the movie was showing why is a bully a bully? And usually it's because something in their life is broken, their heart is broken, their family life is broken, and maybe they need love and they need to be seen. And if we could heal the heart of a bully, we could stop a chain reaction of that person bullying people because they have their needs met. And don't pastors and psychologists often say, if you can't love yourself, how are you supposed to love other people? It, well, the whole message of Switched is love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might and love your neighbor as yourself, which is actually a commandment that we are to love ourselves. And we talk about that in the movie because, right, how can you love somebody else if you hate yourself inside and God loves you. So we address that in the movie as well. You know, Alexandra, it may be very good timing with this kind of movie being released right now during the pandemic. You know, so many teenagers spending even more time, as we mentioned earlier on social media. What kind of feedback are you receiving so far from viewers? It's been overwhelmingly amazing. We get so many messages from parents and kids just saying that it's really encouraged them to lead with love to appreciate what they have in their own family that they've been taking for granted by idolizing someone else. There's a great line in the movie, before we bully or idolize someone, imagine what it's like to go through and walk a day in their shoes. Um, and the messages have just poured in from all over the world of kids sharing how this has changed their life. Uh, we just got a call that a big slumber party happened recently and all the kids picked Switch to watch. And that makes me so happy that it's like a slumber party movie. Now, with Switch, do you actually have a devotional and a Bible study for youth that's available with the film? Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, if people go to switchmovie.com, we have resources all over there. We even have uh, school curriculums. We have a Lead with Love Challenge, which challenges kids to be kind. Uh, we also have, uh, we have devotionals, youth group uh, we have a journal, so we have plenty of materials that you can, and, and families can watch the movie together and then get the devotionals and actually continue the conversation of what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself. One of my favorite TV series when I was a kid was The Dukes of Hazard. That just goes to show you my age a little bit here. And Bo Duke is in your movie, John Schneider. What was it like working with him? He was wonderful. Him and Denise Richards were, you know, they played the um, bullier's parents. And, you know, they did such a great job of finding the humor in. We didn't want those parents to be villainized. We just wanted them to be oblivious to what their daughter's doing. And um, they both came in with such great spirits. And they both, um, they really understood the script and they understood the message. And they both talked about being bullied. And they have children and they wanted to, to, to leave this behind for their kids. You know, Denise Richards came up to me on set day one and gave me a hug and said, I have teenage girls and this is the kind of movies I wanna be a part of to change their perspective. And both of them were a complete joy to work with. They were in it to win it with us. <laughs> that is awesome. Were most of the cast believers? So what well, I, it's not for us it's not a requirement to be a believer because we have had so many people come to know the lord on our movie set so we feel if somebody wants to be a part of a faith-based film we welcome them and invite them into the table because what are they going to do all day listen to the message of jesus and we've actually had people come to know the lord so some of them are christians and some of them aren't um and but oftentimes people come to know him because they were on set and, and were a part of it Oh, that's amazing. Alexandra, let's talk a bit more now about your journey. When you were 19 years old, you were pursuing a career in acting, and you kind of left your faith behind before fully recommitting your life back to Jesus. Tell me more about that. I moved to Los Angeles, California when I was 19 years old in my Toyota Corolla with big hopes to be a movie star. And I got kicked around Hollywood for 10 years tough. I lived in my car. It was a tough time. And after 10 years of pounding the pavement and my life 
derailing. I literally moved to New Mexico and I re-surrendered my life to the Lord and said, okay, God, whatever I'm doing for my life is not working. I want to be in your will. I want whatever you want for my life. I'll go and do it. And I gave up you know, I gave it all up and then God gave it back to me tenfold. And I, he called me to make a uh, female driven faith based films back in 2013. And I say to people all the time, God's plan for our life truly is better than our own plan. And now that I've seen what he has done with my life, when I truly followed him, I'll never, ever, ever want my own plan again. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting too. That's also scriptural as well. You know, follow Jesus and all these other things will come to you as well, will be given to you as well when you pray about them. What advice, Alexandra, do you have for people, young and old, who are considering becoming a professional actor? I think the best thing is to make your own work. Um, as an actor, you cannot work hard enough for someone else to choose you. And that can be very frustrating because you're at the mercy of other people's decisions. So if you can... Uh, write and produce and make your own films so that even if you're waiting for someone to pick you for theirs, you're still being able to be creative on your own terms without waiting for someone else. <laughs> so what are some of the don'ts when it comes to the acting business? What have you learned along the way? Don'ts. Um, don't be mean. <laughs> don't, don't be, don't have an ego. Don't think you're better than people. Um, come and collaborate. You know, I, I've seen a lot of actors who, some actors who come to set and help out with the crew or just are so wonderful to work with. We call those people back. The ones that sit in their trailer and complain, we don't really bring them back. Be a kind person. Everybody, it's a small industry. Everybody knows everyone and everyone I've worked with, some producer will call me and say, how was that experience with that actor? Should I cast them? Your reputation must be guarded with your life in this business because everybody talks and everyone knows. <laughs> Small industry, yes, and never burn a bridge, right? What advice would you have for those behind the scenes, movie makers like writers, directors, and like you, a producer? Yeah, um, I actually wrote Switch too. So I kind of do it all, write, produce, everything. And I guess my biggest uh, advice would be to find an incredible tribe, find people who want to do something different than you. If you are an actor or you're a producer, then you need to find a director and a cinematographer. Don't surround yourself with only people that do what you do, because then you won't have a tribe of filmmakers that can collaborate with you. Find people who want to do something different and bring invite them to the table and all start collaborating on a project. And my first movie, we made it for literally $10,000 in the backyard of a house and with one camera. And, and we just said, let's just do it. And I'm a big believer in, in, in positivity and just say, let's try. And if we fail, so what? We get back up and do it again. Now, as a believer, I want you to tell our viewers about some of the challenges you've had working in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't think that God is very cool in Hollywood. And uh, when he called me to make faith-based films, it was almost like, Oh my gosh, everyone's going to know that I love Jesus, even though I was not a secret about it. But um, one of the things that actually I started doing, because I felt like a lot of Christians in Hollywood didn't tell anybody and they felt very alone. And I found out because I became, you know, a faith-based filmmaker, everyone was like, oh, Alexander, I can tell you I'm a Christian because you make Christian movies. I started opening my home to Christian women entertainment. And it, before COVID hit, it was really booming. And I was creating a space for women to come and share and find their tribe and openly talk about their faith with no judgment. And I also got hooked up with Karen Covell with the Hollywood Prayer Network. Talk about, she knows every single Christian in Hollywood and she is just connecting people. And you wouldn't believe how many Christians are out here. And you know what? It's important for Christians to be in Hollywood. God is here and he needs us to fight for him in entertainment. So. That's a powerful way to reach the multitudes, right? Plus, you've got nice weather. I can see why a lot of believers want to go out to <laughs> SoCal, Southern yeah. California. So, Alexandra, at the end of the day, what do you hope people will really take away from your film, Switched? I hope that they will lead with love before they say something cruel to somebody to really think about how that could affect that person. And if we are kind, the ripple effect of that can change somebody's life. Just saying hi to someone, being kind. And if you're cruel, that ripple effect, we have no idea how long it lasts. Also, if somebody in your life is a bully, 
reach out to them and love on them and see if maybe you can help in the area that there is a reason they're lashing out because something in their life is broken. You could change their life. And I just hope that um, kids would really uh, wake up every day and go, today I'm going to lead with love. On everything I do, I'm going to be kind. Kindness first. How about a very special moment on set with Switched? Every time I talk to writers, producers, directors, they always have a very special moment that really jumps out at them. How about for you with this movie? Yes. Yes, we have a great quick story. All the, the, the girls, all the, the high school girls all arrived first day to start filming the high school scenes. And we were shooting during the Kentucky Derby in Louisville, Kentucky. And the hotel we had for them fell through when they arrived. And we had to put all the girls in a local community house where they all lived together. And we thought it was like the worst thing that could happen that we lost the hotel and they ended up becoming best friends. Every night there was like a movie theater in the house and every night they would watch a teen girl movie which inspired them to go to set the next day and be like, we wanna make the next biggest teen girl movie there ever is. And sometimes God is like, we think something is a curse and God proves it was a complete blessing. And that was, the girls all lived together in a house and it was the best thing that could have happened. That is amazing. What a wonderful story to share. Thanks so much for your time, Alexandra. Alexandra Boylan is the producer of the movie Switched. Make sure you check it out streaming on Pure Flix. Thanks again. Thank you. Streets Alive Mission has been making a big difference here in our community for over 30 years. The amazing ministry helps many of our homeless in our community, including those with addictions. They feed them, clothe them, and help them get on their feet in a very big way. Joining me to talk about it is the co-founder of Streets Alive Mission, Julie Kissick. Welcome back to Bridge City News, Julie. Well, thank you, Hal. Good to be here. So 30 years, three decades, does it feel like it? Well, my hair says it's been 30 years, but it hasn't felt like 30 years at all for me. It's, I look back at 30 years and it feels like just a short span of time because I love what I do. We, we absolutely love what we do. We feel called to do what we do. And so when you get up every morning and you love doing what you're doing, it does not feel like drudgery. It doesn't feel long. You know, a few years ago, you took me on a tour of Streets Alive Inside and it really touched my heart in a big way. You showed me this mural with a lot of the clients on the mural. You knew the backstory, you know, all about their lives. You remember their names and most of those people had passed away. Mm -hmm. And I remember you had tears in your eyes as well at that mm. at that moment. Oh, some of those people became very important to us. It's and, like family, right? And they, they become like family because you do know them so well. And, and because you bury their children and you bury their parents and you bury all their aunties and unky, uncles and you hold them when they cry and you celebrate when they're having a good day. And, and they're just like our family. Now, during the lockdown, Streets Alive did not close the doors, but kept them open to help those who are desperately in need. How was that received in the community? I think it was received really well. Uh, we were one of the few places that was open for them to come into. But one of the important things is that we trustee their money. And so nobody wants to separate anybody from the funds that they have, number one. And they still need clean clothes and they still need a sandwich and they still need a phone and they still need to have that connection with people. So what protocols, Julie, did you and Ken put in place at Streets Alive to protect yourselves, your volunteers, and your clients from COVID-19? Well, here's the funny thing. We were told we had to use a lot of hand sanitizer, but they drink it. So wow. <laughs> the first thing we did is... Well, because the alcohol content, sure, I guess, in there, right? Sure, sure. And now they come in Mickeys and 40s and stuff like that, so it's like very attractive. But we opened up a hand washing station, we opened a bathroom, took the toilet out and just nobody could have any kind of a service unless they wash their hands. And of course, uh, the staff is masked and we offer masks to all of the clientele that come through the door. So if they want to access our service, they have to wash up their hands and wear a mask. Now, one of the branches of your ministry is the new Segway Women's House. What is your real vision for this home? How much time do you have? <laughs> well, we've got another <laughs> another 10 47 or so. seconds. Yeah. Uh, the vision that I have for this home is to have a place for women who have nowhere else to go. Um, I was volunteering in the jail right up until COVID, and time after time, women would be leaving the our my chapel service crying because they had nowhere to go except back to their old situation. And they come out of detox, they have nowhere to go but back to the old situation or treatment back to the old situation. And I wanted to be able to offer them an alternative until they were healthy enough to maybe even face the old situation. And so it's imperative when we help people in recovery that they have a home. 
They have to have a roof. If you, can't, if you don't have a roof, you don't have the opportunity to recover. If you don't have a bed, if you don't have three squares, you have no opportunity to recover. So, How do you get that message across to a lot of your clients that you have to change your surroundings, you have to change your bad habits, and even some of the people you hang out with, which is very difficult for a lot of people, especially if they've been on the streets with a lot of these other people they call friends, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to help them um, get to that place where they're able to say goodbye because we could force it, uh, but we all know that lo the law kills. Or uh, we could talk to them and through the programming and instruction and perspective change, they get to the place where they kind of go, hey, you're unhealthy and toxic for me, so I'm going to actually choose not to be with you. And when they get to that point, that's a powerful point in their life. And don't you have some staff or volunteers that help out that maybe went through the program that were homeless or addicted at one point in time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're up to armpits. Success stories, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And now, like through COVID, we still continue to do our supportive housing. And uh, the men and the women who were in the housing were just so grateful that they had a job to do while uh, we went through that. And they became the, the big supporters of people that were coming to all the services. They were just like, hey, I made it. You can make it. I've done this for six months. You can do it for six days. And it's just been amazing. Now, Streets Alive is a ministry very similar to what we have here at the Miracle Channel. How do you integrate God and Christ's saving grace into the discussion when it comes to helping people off the street? Well, I think that uh, we're fortunate in that people know we are a Christian mission. And so there's a certain expectation that Christianity is going to come out of our mouth. They have an expectation when I sit up beside them and I'm like, hey, can I pray for you? They expect that. And then they always say yes. And my prayer is always that God would touch their heart with his love so that they could have hope to change. Because love changes everything. So Julie, what's needed right now? Uh, besides money? Yeah, well, we can always use money, right? Yeah, we can always use money. But I mean, how about clothing? Winter's just around the corner? Hoodies. For Streets Alive, hoodies. We always need jeans. No matter how many times we get jeans, they disappear like that. When you think that we might serve 25 to 40 people per day, that's 25 to 40 pairs of pants, shirts, socks, underwear. So we're always out of underwear. Uh, we don't like secondhand underwear. We like fresh, clean uh, underwear. Uh, Walmart has a great deal. Just throw that out there. Uh, we always need hoodies so they can layer up. We always need jeans, usually men's 30 to 34. Socks? Uh, socks all day long because right. they get to change their socks every day. We can't change their shoes every day, but we can change their socks every day. What about gloves and tubes gloves, and scarves? That's coming up, right? but uh, yeah. yeah, I think last year we went through six or 7,000 pairs of gloves. The government likes to uh, keep tabs on numbers, like Stats Canada. 30 years, how many clients do you think you have served? streets alive a lot <laughs> i i don't know it's just a lot it's been how many a lot. would you average a day you know through the uh, programs but through the programs and the trusteeship about yeah. 150 a day wow yeah yeah now you're also developing an aplex home for men yeah excited what are some of the needs there everything we need everything there uh we do have a fair amount of furniture um, because we, we've been collecting furniture uh, with our warehouse. And so uh, we let agencies have their first pick of everything. And then we have enough to probably be able to share a little bit into that eightplex. But we same thing. We don't have dishes, bath towels, tea towels, laundry soap, cushions, Chesterfields, chair, like everything. We need everything. And it's an eightplex. And each, each plex has two bedrooms. So that's 16 bedrooms that we have to furnish. Julie, the supervised consumption site at Archer shut down after the province did its audit, the $1.6 million in funds that weren't accounted for, so the province shut it down. Now the province uh, instituted a mobile SES by the soup kitchen in Lethbridge here. Is the province doing enough to help a lot of those who are addicted? Um, no, it's, not called a, it's not called an SCS anymore. It's called an opioid prevention site. Right. And so the SCS allowed all kinds of different drug use, whereas the OPS is intravenous drug use. Okay. So that's probably narrowed the field a little bit. Um, I have an opinion regarding um, intravenous drug use. Um, I pretty much keep it to myself because I've this seen... This is the forum. Come on. I've seen too many dead people. Okay. I've seen too many people die. Um, from putting poison in their veins, but I understand the concept of it. So how do you feel about people like Tim Slaney, used to work at Arches with the Lethbridge Overdose Prevention Society, putting up these pop-up tents 
at Galt Gardens, uh, down by the Civic Center of the field. I think that, you know, I, unsanctioned. Think that I think that he should encourage the people to go to the proper OPS site because they've got medical staff there, they've got social workers, they've got addiction workers, they've got everything set up there to help the person from point A to point B instead of just getting stuck at point A. So I think they're actually doing a disservice to the addicted population. Let's talk about for a moment the importance of providing a safe place for people as they go through recovery. Tell me a bit about that, how important that is. It is so important that it is safe, but also that it is structured. There has to be a purpose while they're living this safe, that safe existence. So we do a lot of psychoeducational stuff. We do a lot of 12-step stuff. We do boundary work. We do all the work um, that is necessary for them to be able to find their own place of safety after they've been safe with us. So that's our goal is like recovery is real. We've seen it. It works. And we know how to help people get to point B. Julie, do you in Canada Streets of Life see a lot of transient people coming in from other towns or cities? Or is it mostly local people here in southwestern Alberta? Well, we saw, you know, a year or so ago, we saw a fairly significant influx uh, from other centers. And part of it was the SES. Like other centers, meaning from Calgary? Yeah. Or? Oh, yeah. We saw lots of different people because we would see they would come in for clothing. We'd be like, where are you from? What's your name? So we saw all these strange people we didn't know come into the building. And uh, we've also seen lately uh, that they've a lot, some of them have transitioned back possibly to old stomping grounds or whatever. So Let's talk about some of the uh, victories that you've seen as well involving your clients. I mean, we mentioned some of them before who we went on to become volunteers or work with you here mm -hmm. at Streets Alive, but just some of those tremendous victories. One, uh, one or two of the victories that I think of right away is uh, one lady who came to us um, out of detox, so she'd only been, you know, uh, detoxed for seven days, and we put her in the house and she stayed with us for two years. So the first year she worked her way through all of our programming and the second year she started at the university taking her social working and addictions degree. And by the time she left, she was already a year into that degree, going strong, stable, able to, to function and do really well. I'm in contact with women who have exited the, the housing and are back working in their jobs. They're, they've got their kids back working with wow. their kids. So I, I hear from a lot of the people um, that have exited the program in a healthy and safe way. We do have some that exit in a not very healthy and safe way, but we do have a significant amount that, that still stay in touch and they've gone on to live the lives that they had hoped they could have. I've chatted with some members of the Lethbridge Police Department here, and uh, they say a big issue right now when it comes to the drugs, it's not so much fentanyl, but it's methamphetamine. Meth. Are you seeing that as well? Well, about 10 years ago, we saw a huge increase in meth. And back then, the people called it meth bridge. Like, I know it's just been coined within the last year or two, but we heard it 10 years ago, this is meth bridge. We saw people transition from pills and, and alcohol and stuff uh, into meth. And then about three or four years ago, we watched them transition their meth to take it intravenously. So yeah, meth is the key drug in our city. Now do you have, you talked about opioids as well, do you have naloxone kits there too? Of course. You have to have lots of those on hand? Yeah, on hand and with our outreach team. Wow. As a matter of fact, uh, we've just contracted to have a, uh, a, a special counselor come into Streets Alive to help them decompress from uh, overdoses and uh, it was worse about a month ago, but um, still they have to be able to have somewhere where they can start to talk about um, somebody just coming back to life and taking a swing at them. Wow. <laughs> what kind of training do your volunteers have to go through in order to be able to handle a lot of what they're seeing? I wish I could remember the term, but our operations director, he does a non-violent intervention course that he, he runs uh, with our staff like every year or every six months, however he sees that that needs to happen so that we learn not to engage up close and personal but how to de-escalate situations so but i'll say with meth it's hard i can imagine that's the, they're just so amped up on the speed and and that sometimes they don't even hear your voice wow so the best time for us to reach out to them is when they're starting to come down off the meth and yeah so in your opinion how can we curtail a lot of the drug use in our city and keep the drugs out of our city you know, we've had a lot of people say, how can we get drugs out of our city? Well, they tried prohibition with the alcohol, and we all know how that worked. Everything went underground. Um, and I think that um, the drug use is with us 
until the end of time because there are always going to be people who are hurt and looking for an anesthetic. And, as and long they're trying as to fill that void. And they're trying Not to fill God, that. Not with God, but with drugs and alcohol. Yeah, they, have, they, they don't know how to go to God. They don't know how to accept his love and let that love work with them because that's a slow process. And, they're, and they want the fast process. They want the, the drug that's going to just take a hold of them and make them feel better instantly. So Quick fix. It is, and it's a powerful fix. Wow. So for people to just say, well, just stop using, it is just not that easy. Julie Kissick, co-founder of Streets Alive Mission here in Lethbridge. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks so much for watching. <laughs>